Welcome to this final webinar of the Church Insurance Company's webinar series. Today's presenters are from Church Insurance. We have Ken Miller from Casualty and Claims Examiner, Paul Stevens, VP for Marketing and Risk Management. Welcome, Ken and Paul. Thank you, Jermaine. Thank you, Jermaine. Hello, everybody. Thank you for spending some time with us this afternoon. Today is our fourth and final episode of Property and Casualty for webinar. We uh, have had great attendance, a lot of great questions in our first three webinars. Today we look forward to covering liability, and we're going to get into directors, officers, otherwise known as DNO, employment practices liability, people call it EPL, and sexual misconduct liability, acronym SM. We will run through the coverages, um, and at the end, we'll get into a claims case study with my colleague, Kim, Ken Miller, from our claims team. Without further ado, Jermaine, next slide. And one more. And you can go ahead and fill it out. <clears throat> All right. So... Directors, officers, employment practices, liability. Uh, with church insurance, these are both contained within the same uh, section of the policy. And we're going to talk about them together, and then we're going to break them out and differentiate them. It's important to understand that. So coverage, protection against civil liability for wrongful acts. This protects the organization, its agents, its directors, officers, including clergy church officers, members, board of directors, and leaders of church-related organizations. It actually drills down all the way to the level of volunteer, and this is the case for both the directors and officers coverage and the employment practices liability coverage. covers wrongful acts. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about timing, limits of coverage, and exclusions, and we'll talk about the self-insured retention, which is a fancy word for deductible. Jermaine, next slide. Okay, so the first thing I like to point out when I'm speaking with vestries and church leadership about directors and officers employment practices liability is that these are really two separate types of coverages and they're really two separate types of risks and we have, uh, as you might imagine, different experience with these two different types of risks. So I'm gonna talk about directors and officers first. Directors and officers, um, and just to put it in perspective, we insure over 92% of the Episcopal Church. We don't get too many straight directors and officers claims. Um, I think the last time I looked at this, we had had one in the course of a three-year period. That claim, just to give you an example, was a gentleman had passed away, left money earmarked for a certain purpose, the vestry got together and used that money for a different purpose. The family found out about it, and we had a lawsuit for the directors and officers. And that's that's the directors and officers claim that I'll give you the example of. That's the one I've seen. So what is directors and officers, what kind of act, wrongful act could this be? It can be an error. It can be an omission. It can be a misstatement a misleading statement, it can be negligence or a breach of duty. When I'm speaking with vestries, a lot of times I'll say, it's things you did that you shouldn't have done, and it's things you shouldn't have done that you did. And uh, But just pointing out, don't see a whole lot of activity on straight directors and officers. And if you look at the insurance marketplace, almost any policy you purchase from a church carrier is going to insure, it's going to have directors and officers built in, or at a very economical price. Directors and officers tends to be a profit center. Uh, like I said, not a lot of activity. Now, let's contrast that with employment practices liability. Same scenario, you know, roughly 6,200 Episcopal churches insured, you know, represents over 92% of all Episcopal churches in the United States. Whereas I told you, directors and officers, we see one claim in maybe a three year period. With EPL, we see 25 to 30 per year. Typical, what type of wrongful acts are we looking at? It's generally wrongful termination, failure to employ, a deprived opportunity, wrongful evaluation or demotion, 
It would also cover things like any kind of discrimination, violation, civil rights, sexual harassment, retaliation, liable slander, defama defamation, wrongful discipline, failure to enforce, enforce policy. The, by far, what we see in the Episcopal Church is wrongful termination. We do see sexual harassment to a certain degree, but by far, most of our activity is around wrongful termination. And if you think about the typical Episcopal Church being uh, middle-sized or small, maybe ASA, average Sunday attendance, less than 100 in a lot of cases, um, do these folks generally have robust human resource departments? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is no, as you might imagine. Many cases, uh, what we'll see, and I'll give you an example of a claim I've seen, uh, parish administrator there for 25 years, new clergy comes in, quickly notices that the parish administrator is not keeping the office hours or getting the work done that is supposed to be done, but, and at some point takes action and terminates that individual. Individual files suit, and in the suit during discovery, they're looking for the job description, where are the written performance evaluations, where is the warnings, where's the verbal warning, where's all these things that should have and would have happened in a typical corporation. Well, unfortunately, in, the, in a church situation, you, you generally aren't going to see that, except at maybe some of the bigger churches and or at a diocese, of course. So wrongful termination by far is the claim we see under employment practices liability. If there's anybody out there who's not insured with church insurance, I want you to take a special note to check with your agent to make sure you have employment practices liability. This is usually an expensive coverage to get as it does have a lot of action. And many times when I'm reviewing uh, coverage that folks have other places, this is a gap that I find. So if you're not with church insurance, make sure you take a look at that. Make sure you confirm you have the coverage. And we'll go to the next slide. Timing considerations for directors and officers and employment practices liability. This is getting to, you know, what triggers a claim. Coverage is triggered by a claim presented during the policy period because of the wrongful act that has taken place after a designated retroactive date. All right, so a retroactive date, we'll get into that a little bit, but there's three elements here. The original event date must be after the retroactive date, meaning uh, when, the, when the loss occurred, so to speak. The policy retroactive date must be before the event happened, of course. Retroactive date is generally the date you join that policy. So if you were coming to us from somewhere else and you joined us January 1st, 2019, you would see a retroactive date of January 1st, 2019. The claim must be presented within the policy term. So as, if, you're on a, if you're with us um, and you're with us for years, your, your policy basically renews every year. There's never a break in coverage. So it goes back to the original retro date. So three elements. The event must take place after the retro date. The retro date must be before the event. That's just the opposite way of saying that. And the claim must be presented during the policy term. And we'll go to the next slide, Jermaine. All right, let's talk about limits of coverage with DNO and EPL. Per occurrence limit, that's the maximum amount of coverage for a single event, regardless of the number of parties involved. With church insurance, that's a million dollars. Annual aggregate limit, maximum amount of coverages for all occurrences during the policy term. Standard policy is a million dollars with church insurance. The umbrella does extend the directors and officers portion. Defense costs. A little different than uh, what we'll talk about later when we get to sexual misconduct. When you're, when you're talking about directors, officers, employment practices, liability, defense costs are included within the limit. What that means is that you have a million-dollar limit to settle the claim and pay the defense cost, and we'll contrast that with sexual misconduct a little later. There is a duty to defend. The policyholder delegates the responsibility of selecting, paying, and controlling the defense counsel to the insurance company. Um, 
there are times where I have seen insureds, uh, usually this is at a diocesan level where they want to talk to us about who they who we use, and we do have those conversations from time to time. But there's a duty to defend. Next slide, please, Jermaine. Exclusions. All right, so some of these are pretty obvious. You know, illegal gain or profit or advantage by the policyholder, excluded. Some of these will get a little confusing because they're covered in other places, and this second bullet point's an example. Bodily injury, property damage, personal injury, these are covered under general liability policy. So that was the policy we talked about last week, which is with the Church Insurance Company of Vermont. Liability assumed by contract, again, these are normally covered under the general liability policy. There is an exclusion uh, for certain federal statutes, including ERISA. That's typical across the industry. You'll see that. Next page, Jermaine, we continue. Pollution. Uh, excluded under most policies, there are specialty pollution products out there that are designed for folks that actually need that exposure, uh, but generally uninsurable for many decades in the U.S., Civil or criminal fines, penalties, or taxes, again, in line with tort. Claims related to security transactions. So those, that's a summation of your exclusions. What you see there is some, certain things that, you would, that seem pretty obvious why they're excluded. Other things that are excluded because they're better covered under other policies. And we'll go to the next slide, Jermaine. Okay. So now... We're going to get into sexual misconduct liability, and we're going to talk about the basics, and then we'll drill down into this a little bit. Coverage. So the risk, physical or emotional injury because of sexual abuse, molestation, or exploitation. And on the next few slides, we will run through basis, limits, and defense being outside the limit. And next slide, please. Okay. Basis of coverage for sexual misconduct. I want, we're going to talk about two different versions of this. Church insurance follows an occurrence basis uh, for sexual misconduct. What that means is coverage is triggered by a claim that took place during the policy period, regardless of when claims are made. Um, a little later, in a couple minutes, we'll talk about another option that some of our insureds have asked us to take a look at, which is called claims made basis. And we are learning a lot about it. And there are some benefits to it uh, that I'll, I'll outline for you briefly. But back to occurrence basis. So church insurance company, if you're with us, you're on an occurrence basis for sexual misconduct coverage. What that means this is this. Let's say that a church joined the program with church insurance in 1971. They've kept that coverage in place ever since, which is not unusual. In the year 2019, a claimant follows a lawsuit that says, in 1973, I was sexually abused at the church. The occurrence basis says that we're going to be, the coverage is triggered by a claim that took place during the policy period. 1973 was during the policy period in that it was after coverage started with us in 1971 in this example. These are what we call legacy claims. So um, one, of the, one of the things that I've noticed over the years is since Safeguarding God's Children was implemented in 2003, we don't see a whole lot of new activity in this regard. Most of what we see are what we call legacy claims. So it's a, Things that happen years, sometimes decades ago. I know we recently received one from the 1960s. When that happens, we have to hopefully find a copy of that policy, between, and the insured has to find a copy of that policy. They have to look at that policy and say, was there coverage? Was sexual misconduct covered at that time? If so, what was the limit? As you can imagine, in 1965, the limit for sexual misconduct may not have existed, or it may have been lower than it currently is. But that's a current basis. Currently, with church insurance, if you're insured with us, you have a million dollar per occurrence with a $2 million aggregate, and you have another million dollars in your umbrella policy, which we issue with every policy we write. We'll talk about that a little later. Let's contrast that with claims made, which is something that we have been exploring uh, 
because we've, we're constantly challenged with meeting our mission of providing very broad coverage in a financially sustainable way. Claims made sexual misconduct coverage tends to be a little less expensive because it eliminates the looking back of the trigger. So coverage is triggered by a claim presented during the policy period that has taken place after a retro date. So this is similar to the approach, this is the approach of directors and officers of employment practices. Again, it's nothing that we do at this time, but it is something that many of our insureds have asked us to explore because there is substantial cost savings. The other thing about it is you are looking at the current policy, which is generally easier for folks to find, and you have the current limit, which is generally higher than it may have been 50 years ago. So just want you to know we're always listening and claims made sexual misconduct is something we have heard from folks and we are looking at it and we bring that information back to folks who are interested in it. Next slide. Limits of coverage sexual misconduct. Again, we are currently a per occurrence form, maximum amount of coverage for a single event regardless of the number of parties involved, million dollar per occurrence. The annual aggregate is the maximum amount of coverage for all occurrences during the policy term, five or $2 million for sexual misconduct. Sublimit and our specific aggregate. That's what I just mentioned. If you recall from last month when we talked about general liability, you may recall that the aggregate for general liability is $5 million. However, the sublimit for a specific aggregate for sexual misconduct is not $5 million, it's $2 million. And most folks will say, I wonder why that is. And you can kind of answer your own question because what you realize is that when you try to go to the market and reinsure this type of exposure, there's not a huge appetite out there for higher limits from reinsurers and or the pricing is such that it isn't something that's economical to most insureds. But we still uh, enjoy a very robust sexual misconduct limit. Um, when I compare it to the other players in the church marketplace, I typically will see in the church marketplace limits of 300000 I've seen it as low as 50000 uh, In my estimation, probably not enough to settle a single claim. But if you're with church insurance, you have a million occurrence, two million aggregate. It is a specific aggregate. And as I pointed out earlier, and I want to contrast for a second, with sexual misconduct, defense is outside the limit. What that means is that you have a million to settle the claim, and then you have additional coverage that's unlimited for defense cost. Now, I say unlimited, we are very good with the premium dollars you send us to make sure that we're not spending unnecessary money on defense attorneys and dragging cases on and on and on. We really wanna help people. When we get a claim like this, we wanna help people, we wanna get them into counseling, we wanna work on a settlement, we say, Sexual misconduct claims are not like fine wine. They do not get better with age. So, uh, and obviously the public relations aspect of that is as important to us as well as it is to the church and the diocese. So we tend to settle these as, as expeditious as possible um, and try to get them uh, taken care of and get these folks the help that they need and move forward with things. To the next slide, please. Umbrella and our excess liability. So if you think about, you know, you, you may have an umbrella policy on, at home with regard to your condo policy or your renter's policy or your homeowner's policy. And what we know about umbrella and excess liability is it's just another layer of coverage that you buy in excess of the primary coverage. So if you're one of the 92% of Episcopal churches that are insured with us, you can rest assured that you have at least a million dollar umbrella. We offer also up to a $10 million limit in churches. The purpose is to protect an organization and its people against a catastrophic liability beyond the scope of the primary insurance policies. Consider for the following policies and coverage types. So it extends your general liability. Your base policy gives you a million. You've got at least another million. Uh, a lot of times schools will buy four million or 10 million. It extends coverage for pastoral counseling. With church insurance, it does, exclude, it does extend sexual misconduct, but only by an additional million dollars. Generally, when I'm looking at umbrella excess policies in the marketplace with the typical church carriers, that we compete against, 
I do not generally see sexual misconduct in their umbrella. Uh, these are for-profit carriers. It doesn't mean they're bad folks. It just means that they're smart for what they're trying to do. If you're trying to make a profit, you, you want to kind of limit your sexual misconduct liability. Excess coverage will extend your auto liability. So if you own an auto or even have non-owned auto exposures, which we all do, it will extend that beyond the first million dollars that's built in. Directors and officers, it ex our policy does extend that in full. There's no sublimit to that. Employer's liability, which is another way of saying workers' compensation. Now, the first thing that I point out to people, you know, it's this industry is known for showing you the big print. The big print giveth and the small print taketh away. What's the small print here? What's missing? Employment practices liability. The umbrella, the excess policy does not give you any additional employment practices liability. From time to time, as we renegotiate our reinsurance treaties, we will ask our reinsurance carriers, hey, is there a way to get some employment practice liability coverage into the umbrella? They will ask us to look at the losses. We show them the 25 or 30 that we have like clockwork every year, and there's not an offer. I have yet to see employment practice liability in anyone else's umbrella in the church niche. Um, so it's pretty common. Now, there are ways around that. We can, as an agency, we can go out and place you separate coverage with someone like Chubb and get you limits that are higher than, than what you currently have. And from time to time, that becomes necessary. I don't see it a lot, but it is something we can do. And just speaking to that, when you find yourself in a situation where you have a need that isn't uh, contemplated by the basic policy or the umbrella or the portfolio you currently have, I want you to keep in mind Church Insurance Agency is always here to look at the market to find solutions for you. And we'll go to the next slide. DNO, EPL, SM, Liability Risk Management. Next slide. So we have a few things that uh, speak to this. The first, obviously, with regard to sexual misconduct is safeguarding God's children. I was just looking at statistics for this program today. As many of you know, in 2003, this was launched through General Convention. Uh, we still sell physical copies through the website of DVDs and training materials. However, by far, most folks have moved to the online version, which rolled out starting in 2008. It helps to reduce claims. More importantly, it protects children. Uh, there are some tools with regard to training, background checks. Obviously, the online program, we should all in the fiscal church take a little time to, uh, to recognize the job we have done. We have over 200,000 registered users meaning people who are registered, engaged in the training, who have taken over 800,000 courses. It's something to uh, that when I look at it, I'm amazed by it, and it helps to explain why we don't see as many claims currently as we did in prior years, those legacy claims I mentioned. The other thing I'll talk about, too, Safeguarding God's Children, Safeguarding God's People is a program you know, where there's training materials out there as well, and uh, these are things that are set up to protect adults, so more of the sexual harassment side of things. But uh, that's a, these are good risk management tools. Proof is in the pudding. Uh, if you are unaware of Safeguarding God's Children or any of that information, you can find information on our website. You may know that the uh, denomination is going through a bit of a transition with regard to this material. 2015 General Convention created a task force which in 2018 came back with new model policies and is currently working on new training materials. Uh, this is likely to be out of the hands of church insurance at some point. We continue to fund the current program and to support it fully, and there is information on the CPG website about this. Employment practices. Sometimes you get into situations that are so unique or so potentially volatile that you're going to require outside counsel from the diocese and or an employment attorney, another risk management tool. Um, and then la last but not least, I point you back to our safety and insurance ebook for churches. 
You can download your free copy at the address you see on your screen. This is a great resource. It's a PDF. It's over 100 pages long. has a searchable index, so you don't have to look through the whole book to find that one paragraph you're looking for to answer that question that you have in front of you. And, of course, we're always available to help you as well. Next slide. All right. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to my good friend and colleague, Ken Miller, in the claims department. He's going to lead you through a case study from a claim perspective of an employment practices liability claim. Ken, take it away. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I hope everybody's having a good afternoon. Uh, instead of uh, making up a specific claim scenario, I thought it'd be helpful to just to take you through uh, some of the claims processes and some of the types of questions and information that we need and some of, uh, some of the issues I see with employment claims. Uh, typically, there are two reasons why an employee loses his job. Uh, that would be job elimination due to uh, budget or organizational constraints or uh, performance issues. Uh, Jermaine, you can go to the next screen. Thank you. I would say that 90% of employment claim, the, the employment claims we get involve discrimination that leads to termination of employees. Uh, common types of uh, claims uh, involve uh, sexual discrimination, uh, workplace harassment. Uh, you know, this involves uh, uh, allegations of uh, workplace intimidation, hostile or, or offensive uh, work in environment, age discrimination, racial discrimination, uh, disability discrimination. Now, people are under the impression that it's easy to file an employment claim and that they're always successful. The fact is, if you have a well-documented rationale for making employment decisions or changes, you will likely either avoid a lawsuit or be in a good position to defend a lawsuit. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, let's talk about um, when the notice and when you're first calling in a claim. Uh, basically, we're going to ask you for some uh, information, the uh, policy number, uh, information about the uh, individual employee, age, the job description, uh, some general information about the loss, and any paperwork you might have received. For example, uh, a letter of representation from a lawyer, a lawsuit, uh, human rights filing uh, through the state or through the federal government. Uh, we'll get that information, and then uh, first thing we do is we're going to confirm coverage, confirm that you have a policy in place, and also that the allegations that are being made against you in the complaint are uh, fit the definition of what the coverage is. Um, employment uh, claims typically involve protective classes, and a couple of those are uh, age, uh, people that are 40 years or older, uh, sex, uh, race, uh, whether they're disabled, uh, perhaps uh, religious issues, that type of thing. Uh, so after we uh, go through that coverage, uh, we're going to start investigating your claim. And uh, this uh, involves obtaining information from you about the termination. So it'll be assigned to a claims examiner, and usually we'll, we'll be, be a contact person at the church or at the organization, and uh, we'll call, and the first thing we're going to ask about is, why was the person terminated? Generally, what happened? And then from that, we'll get into some details. Uh, we'll, we, may ask the, we, may, we may ask to uh, speak to the supervisor or coworker for clarification on the issues. Um, we're going to ask for proof, documents, that support the reason for the termination. And this uh, usually includes a copy of the personnel file, um, some type of file or information uh, concerning the job action or the termination. Uh, this would include emails, copy of texts, or any paperwork you're going to have concerning the issue. Now, concerning your organization's documentation to defend against uh, a wrongful termination claim, I would suggest that when there are performance management issues involving an employee, that you maintain a detailed file. 
and this is going to include saving any emails, letters, examples of job, job performance issues, and termination paperwork that you might get. It's also very helpful uh, every time you have a phone conversation or meeting with anybody within the organization about this issue, whether it be a coworker, supervisor, or the employee himself, that you keep a detailed running diary of the conversation. Next thing we're going to look for is, does your organization have a written process concerning performance management and job separation? Paul had mentioned earlier uh, uh, things like uh, verbal written warnings, uh, that type of thing. It's important that your organization, even a small organization, have uh, some type of a written process to handle these types of matters. And the process should be fair and it's got to be reasonable. It doesn't have to be fancy or complicated. It's important to write it down and make sure that all the people in the organization are well aware of what happens. Uh, let me give you an example. If you're having an issue with an employee's job performance, you might set up a performance management structure that gives the individual the opportunity to improve. At the same time, you're warning them that if they don't improve, there, there are consequences, including termination from employment. It's important to be reasonable and give the employee the time, ability to improve uh, his uh, job performance. Uh, first step, typically, is going to be a verbal or written warning. Uh, you're going to want to have a meeting, a conversation with the individual. You're going to want to uh, talk about the uh, performance issues, suggest ways to improve, and give them a specific time frame to correct the issues and make sure they're aware of the fact that if these uh, issues are not uh, corrected that there might be uh, additional uh, consequences to it moving on. You may want to move to the next step which is probation. Uh, this is a, a sort of a, a, a another step where again you're defining problems, you're suggesting um, ways to improve and you're giving them a specific time frame to improve. But it's important that during this process that you make sure and you're documenting the consequences if the improvement or changes don't take place. The key to it is document, document, document. So a kind of a quick summary, if there is performance management issues with an employee, it's important to clarify any process your organization has, document what's happened, keep a, keep a good file, and also uh, make sure you're documenting the end results. <clears throat> I wanted to spend a little time uh, talking about, uh, I call it the term disgruntled employee. This is a very common problem uh, and uh, often there are problem in employment cases and they're very difficult to handle. The issue is the, um, the negativity involved in dealing with a disgruntled employee clouds our judgment. It's very frustrating. So you get frustrated, it blinds you, and you fail to deal with the real employment issues and how they are affecting your organization. I think we, I think we all have examples of disgruntled employees. Often these employees are uh, unmotivated, they, uh, they're declining, they decline to join uh, team or office events, uh, they don't uh, seem to respect the organization or individuals within the organization. They're really disconnected from the organization, and for your organization, this uh, this uh, spreads a negative energy, uh, promotes uh, complaining among employees, and encourages perform poor performance for people. So a disgruntled employee is going to make us angry. I mean, you're working hard, only to have an employee that that can't get anything done and doesn't seem to care. But we can't let the anger and the frustration that is involved with it cloud what we're doing. Uh, with documenting and uh, making sure uh, that uh, we're doing the right thing with um, any any uh, management uh, employment management uh, processing here, be careful in the way you handle these individuals. The problem with defending an employment claim against a disgruntled employee is that you may get get so wrapped up in the negative attitude and symptoms that you fail to identify the reasons behind the termination. Now, once we get this information concerning the loss and we feel comfortable with, we understand what happened in the organization, 
our next step uh, as, a, as a claims examiner is going to be to evaluate uh, the, uh, the case facts. And uh, we um, try to understand both the state and federal laws and standards, case laws concerning these issues and how, the, how it applies. Uh, we may get an employment lawyer involved immediately to, if it's a complicated uh, or unusual situation. We uh, make decisions about the potential civil exposure against the organization. Uh, the bottom line is that the organization do anything legally wrong and does it constitute a legitimate employment claim. If this is the case, we may decide to settle. We may decide to um, evaluate the legal damages and uh, this would involve uh, usually the like, severity of the issues involved, uh, the effect on the individual. Uh, typically this involves if the person had any kind of psychological counseling, that type of thing, any lost wages or future lost wages, um, basically any monetary uh, value uh, issues uh, for the wrongful act. Last step is going to be try to settle it. A lot of times we'll do it on the phone. Often we'll uh, set up mediations, uh, in-person mediations, uh, get all the parties together and try to uh, work out um, a settlement. Um, so basically the key to uh, defending yourself doing the right thing for these types of claims is going to be to document well, keep it simple and clear, and uh, don't be afraid to reach out to us uh, here at Church Insurance Company and ask questions. We're always here to help you. Thanks. All set. Thank you, Steve and Ken, for your presentations. We will now open the webinar for your comment questions for discussion on today's topics. Now, just as a reminder, there are two ways to ask a question or make a comment. One, you can enter a question or comment using the questions window of your GoToWebinar control panel. We will read these questions out loud and in the order that they are sent to us. Second, you can ask a question live. Here is how we will manage live questions. The vertical bar to the left of your GoToWebinar control panel, you should see an icon that looks like a hand. This is the raise hand icon. By clicking on this icon, we can see that you have raised your hand. Then I will unmute you and ask you to go ahead with your question or comment. Please say your name and what institution you represent if your um, question or comment is for a specific person. So our first question is, I'm the rector. I fell in our church parking lot back in February on an icy Friday, work day. If I or my administrator had been seriously injured in such a fall, would that be covered under workers' comp or general injury liability. Okay, this is Paul Stevens. That scenario would be addressed under workers' compensation coverage because it involves an employee or someone that fits the definition of an employee. Thank so you. Subject to that policy, you would want to give uh, us a call uh, if you've got a workers' compensation policy with us and we could walk you through a process. Perfect. Next question, if you have an at-will clause in an employment agreement, does that protect you from employment lawsuits? This is Paul and Ken, you can weigh in. Doesn't it, it doesn't protect you from a lawsuit. Anybody can file a lawsuit. It may or may not, depending on the situation in the state, uh, have some effect with how that lawsuit is disposed of, but does not preclude anyone from suing you. Ken, you want to add to that? I agree with with Paul, and also also it depends on the state jurisdiction you're in and how uh, what the laws are concerning that. All right, thank you. Next, do you have an example of a fair, simple written policy regarding job performance or employee evaluations that you could share with us or send to us? This is Paul Stevens. We really, because it's different from state to state and sometimes even in municipalities, it's nothing that we can speak to. It's outside of our mission. You would, I would refer you to your diocese for specific guidance in that regard. 
Thank you. Next question. Regarding a terminated employee, how far from the past can they bring a claim? Ken, is there uh, a limitation? There, there are uh, statute of limitations. Uh, we, we handle 50 states, and so every state has got a different statute of limitation. Uh, very easy to look it up in the website. Uh, you know, Google it uh, for your state and for employment-related uh, issues, and you probably get a good uh, answer on that. That's right. Perfect. Thank you both. Those are all the written questions. Oh, uh, before I even got to finish that, our next question says, is there a plan for a basic safeguarding God's children introduction among the online offerings that is suitable for group presentation? Our diocese asks people to attend a face-to-face -face training for their first encounter with this material. It is becoming increasingly difficult to find appropriate hardware for projecting the old DVDs. Okay, this is Paul Stevens. I can I can handle that question. I head up the current safeguarding program that is in the process of being sunsetted. And as I mentioned before, and you'll find some information on our website, we're in an interesting transition period. The uh, general convention is taken uh, and has assigned really, for lack of a better word, ownership of the model policies, uh, which were originally from church insurance. Those are now out of the national church. It became part uh, a general convention in 2018. Those were, imp those were implemented, finalized and implemented. So that's outside of our mission at this point. Now what's happening, uh, in my best of my understanding, not being involved uh, in it, is General Convention in 2018 uh, created a committee to come up with training materials to support the new model policies. CPG has one consultant voice on that committee, and we're really just there, who's one of our employees out of CPG, and we're really just there to give context to history and things we've learned and share information that we already have. So it's a long way of saying the training materials will, as we understand it, will be out of our mission at some point, and it looks like the goal of General Convention 2021 is to have new training materials. So at this point, CPG is really just keeping the current program flying, uh, which is a very robust online program, uh, and the DVDs are, are still the old Episcopal program, the branded Episcopal program that you saw with Safeguarding God's Children. Obviously, no plans for us to do anything new with that as we await uh, the transition to the National Church. So you'd really have to reach out to the folks um, it, through the National Church, which there's some information on our website that will lead you that way. But as far as I understand it, no new materials are created. They're still really exploring it. Uh, and I think the goal is that they have something available in 2021. But, again, it will be outside the CPG's mission uh, as far as being the distributor of that or producer of that. Thank you. Next question. Church has a new treasurer. New treasurer reports that parish administrator – has been working 22 hours per week going all the way back to January 2013. No pension has been established or paid for this employee. Can the church make a claim under employee benefits liability to bring this employee up to date in terms of lay pension? This is Paul, and I'll let Ken weigh in, but basically we would have to have someone trigger that claim uh, reach out to us, and we'd have to take a look at the specific scenario to see if there's any coverage available there. So what I would say for that person is probably the best place to start would just give our, our, our claims folks a call at 800-223-5705, and they will uh, confidentially go over the details with you and determine make a coverage determination. Ken, do you have anything to add? I agree with that, and and you know, anytime you have a question concerning your policy or a specific issue you want to discuss, pick up the phone. We're here, and we uh, 
We are more than happy to uh, talk about the issue and try to help you get, get through it. All right, thank you. Next question. We have an employee who was hurt doing a volunteer activity sponsored by the diocese. They were there as a volunteer. Would their health expenses be covered under workers' comp or their general health insurance, or the diocese's general liability? That is a little gray because we have an employee. So to the extent that they're acting on behalf of the church as an employee, whether or not it's a volunteered situation or not, we'd have to kick the tires on that. Uh, so the answer would be on that, I would give us a call because there sounds like that'd be a pretty specific review we'd want to do. Generally, if you're an employee and you're hurt in the scope of your work and you have the workers' compensation coverage, that's where the coverage is going to come. Um, so, But in this case, I've heard enough to know it's a little gray, so I would suspect you give, uh, I would suggest that you give Ken and his team a call and they can walk you through the the details of your specifics. He, Paul is right, uh, but typically uh, if you're uh, an employee and you're volunteering, uh, uh, often on behalf of your organization, your, your, the church, you're going to be covered under workman's compensation benefits. Not always, and you, you, it's, it's important that you contact us and, as you said, kick the tires and we'll try to get through it and try to figure it out for you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. As we pause for a second from typed in questions, I will check and see if we have anyone who wants to ask a question live. And I do not see anyone with their hand raised. So I'll just give a second or two more for any people that would like to raise their hand and or type in a question. So in that meantime, while you're still thinking about it, I want to tell you about the feedback survey. Yes, we also have a feedback survey for you. We truly do take into account your feedback. When the webinar ends, a screen will pop up asking you to complete the survey. Thank you in advance, giving us your opinion and suggestions. All right, one more question. Does liability coverage extend to church volunteers who respond to an organized ministry that provides rides to church on Sunday? So basically the liability coverage covers the church's operations so to the extent that this activity is a church-sponsored activity, uh, the liability would typically respond. Got it. And that sounds like non-owned auto or, or owned auto, depending on who owns the vehicle. Perfect. All right. I see no more questions and no more hands raised. So I will say... Thank you for your participation and feedback. Thank you presenters for your participation and information. Thank you members of the webinar for giving us time in your busy schedules. And don't forget, please check the webinar page in the Administrators Resource Center, ARC, and that's at cpg.org forward slash ARC for information and registration links for upcoming webinars. Once again, please give us your feedback on the survey. This concludes this webinar. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks again. Take care.